Hello. So today we are going to also talk about, in addition to spirituals, we're going to talk about the blues. And the blues was kind of like the next evolution of spirituals. We're jumping forward in time and we're jumping forward in the progression of this music. So um, you're going to want to make sure you are in our class Google Drive file. It's in that same origins folder where we found spirituals and we're going to open the blues. I already have it open here because I was having some internet slow down. So, all right, here we go. So the blues was born from the songs of the enslaved African people. Black Americans were now living in a post-slavery America that was still extremely segregated by both law and by custom. And what that means is even if it wasn't technically a law, most in most locations, people still kind of lived separate, separate neighborhoods, separate, um, maybe separate restaurants. Like even if it wasn't technically law, there was still a lot of segregation. And in the South, you start to see um, a difference. So like the North, it's more by custom. In the South, it's still on the books as a law. You may have heard of Jim Crow laws, which typically refer to um, when you see pictures of like separate water fountains with the signs or separate waiting rooms, separate schools, separate universities, right? Um, that is segregation by law, typically called Jim Crow laws. And in the North, you saw... A little, a little less, but it was more still by custom. Um, the blues continued to be a method of passing along the music of hope, sorrow, work, spirituality, and equality down through the generations. In this later genre, the options for creating music expanded from what it had been before. However, black musicians were still oppressed in many ways. So when I say expanded, I mean um, now you have more access to instruments. You're allowed to... You know, like people can practice, people can share music together. You can go to a club and listen to some blues, right? So there's, there's, you know, way more freedom in that regard, um, but not a lot of freedom in the mixing of white people listening to blues and vice versa with other genres. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the road to making it in the music business was extremely challenging for most black artists, especially men. For the first time in music history, we see black female blues musicians having more success as performers in a music genre than their male counterparts. Typically, especially throughout Western music, which we had to skip, most of the famous old school dead white composers that you've heard of, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, you know, most people, your average person cannot even name one female composer. I can name a few because I've been in the game a while, but even I can only name maybe two or three, you know, from the old school European stuff. Um, so music has always been very male dominated. Um, but in the blues for the first time due to racism, which is ironic, we see women blues singers actually selling records and male blues singers, not so much. And the reason for that typically was black males were found to be more threatening. Um, so the only way a black um, blues singer could really make it, make it in the business was to dress up as like a caricature of themselves, almost like they were a clown. You may have seen the old videos um, of, you know, wearing like black men would exaggerate their own features with makeup and wear like almost almost a clown suit and they would come on stage and they'd be kind of silly and kind of slapstick comedy and they'd sing but it was like they were they were almost making fun of themselves and not in like a not in like a self-deprecating cute way in like a super self-loathing way which is like when you watch those old clips it's like super uncomfortable um but the black female blues singers didn't really need to do that to sell records. They were seen as less threatening. So, um, okay. Well, I kind of explained that in that last paragraph, early 1900s, black male blues musicians could often only achieve record sales and live performances by dressing comically in costume and makeup and performing as a caricature of themselves. Next paragraph, the contribution of blue notes is very important to the distinct blue sound. Blue notes are minor scale borrowed lower notes that add a hint of sadness in a melody. So, um, here, let me grab my guitar real quick. So let's see. So here's a major, a little major riff. I'm gonna go do, re, mi. Do, re, mi. Very happy, right? If I make it minor, do, re, mi, do, re, mi. 
kind of adds a little sadness, right? That borrowed minor note can be referred to as a blue note, okay? It's, it sounds a little sad, it's a little blue. So you start to see from spirituals, which had a ton of these blue notes, right? We're expressing sadness, they were sorrow songs. Working in the fields, you're tired, your, your back hurts, you're, you know, you have this sadness that in music we wound up kind of, oh, that's a minor blue note, right? And it sort of made its way into the blues. Um, so hopefully that kind of explains it. It's something you just get used to hearing more than knowing. Um, <clears throat> like when you hear, sometimes I feel like a motherless child, right? You hear that and you're like, whoa, that's so sad. Like not only are the words said, but the melody. Da, 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 da. Woo. You know, even without the words, it's still a sad melody. And it's because it leans on those blue notes and those minor sounds. All right. Um, so in the early 1900s, these black artists had formed a musical style all their own. The spiritual genre had evolved. Um, now we see the incorporation of drums, guitar, piano, bass, vocals all coming together. Guitar started to have a more prominent role. And this... This new idea of having the guitar being like a prominent instrument um, will carry all the way through rock and roll as we progress and country music. Um, part of it was access. You know, the, the mass production of guitars, you know, wasn't really a thing. And then you start to see as we progress into um, the later blues, you start to see the evolution of the electric guitar, which is being mass produced, you know, by Les Paul and these these early guitar manufacturers. Um and that kind of changed the sound too, right? You go from this acoustic, like the guitar I was just playing, this more acoustic sound to more of an electric sounding blues. Um, so that was super important. Um, the other essential creation to come from blues music is the blues form. Now, I just made a second video that's going to accompany this um, that you need to watch also. And that kind of explains the blues form in more detail. So after you finish this video, hop over and watch the blues explanation. Uh, blues form is a series of chord progressions used time and time again. And it's like a recipe for a song. That's the definition I want you to know, the recipe. And it allows for improvising. You have one person playing these, these simple chords underneath and someone else making up a solo to express themselves, right? Um, over top of it. And um, you can improvise vocally. You can sing, like, you ever heard of scat singing where a jazz singer's like, do ba do ba da ba do ba do do ba do do ba do ba do ba do ba right? They're just making it up. It's nonsense on the spot, right? Or playing a trumpet or playing a saxophone or playing a guitar or the piano, improvising. Um, often in the blues, too, we see call and response, which is um, the example I always tell people is, y'all know the song Shout, where it's like, you know you make me wanna and everyone goes shout put my hands up and shout put my hands up and shout da, 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 shout right um it's a call and response between the singer and everyone else or the singer and the band um you see this coming out of the gospel church right can i get an amen amen hallelujah hallelujah right this call and response i say you respond that came out of the work songs out of spirituals, right? People communicating in the field. When is it quitting time? I think it's time to go on home. Yeah, it's time to go on home, right? This little back and forth you get going, um, people communicating. And it, it moved into the blues and it moved into gospel churches, black gospel churches specifically, and it would work its way into rock and roll. How many of you have heard, hey Jude, na, 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 hey Jude, right? Everyone's singing along. It's kind of a call and response group effort. Um, it's all over the pages of music history. Um, all right, lost my train of thought here. So call and response in the fields would send messages, lift spirits, pass the time during long days working. This call and response would continue into the blues, black gospel churches, all the way through rock and pop. All right. Uh, the sound of the blues tended to vary depending on where the artists were located geographically. Again, we're talking pre-internet, pre, you know, you have no way to really share music 
besides playing it, uh, eventually we'd get records going here pretty soon. We're about to get to that point where we have some shellac records going on. Um, but the biggest way the blues was taught was through rote and through copying, right? You'd go watch a blues band. You'd go, oh, okay, they're doing an A7 chord. And okay, I'm going to go home and figure that out. Or I'm going to jam with these people on a porch somewhere or whatever. And we're going to figure it out. I'm going to join their band. Then I'm going to go start my own thing. And then we're going to teach someone else. And it became this, this student to teacher, teacher to student, passing it on, passing it on. And so what happens is you have these different regions, right? You've got the Detroit area blues. You've got the Southern blues. Um, New Orleans was huge in the jazz scene. You've got the Chicago blues, the Memphis blues, the Delta blues, right? You've got all these different little pockets where people are learning and practicing and stuff evolves. Um, the biggest analogy there would be accents. Someone with a New York accent is different than a Boston accent, different than a Texan or a Californian or someone from Minnesota or even Iowa. You know, you get these different little accents because people speak with each other and stuff kind of has pockets. The blues was the exact same way. Um, now, if you're a blues expert, I wouldn't claim to be a blues expert. Um, I probably know more than the average person, but I'm definitely not an expert. An expert could hear a blues and go, oh, that's Chicago. Oh, that's Detroit. Like being able to tell the difference. I don't think I'm quite there yet. I can usually tell a Dixieland blues pretty easy, like a, like a Southern, you know, New Orleans blues or jazz. But um, so being able to tell that, you know, that, that means you really know your stuff. Okay, so down here on the second page, we have um, a little example of the 12 bar blues. And uh, again, I said that second video delves more into that. It uses a different progression than this one, different key. But um, please watch that after this. Okay, so some quick facts you should know. Uh, the first blues recording by a female African-American singer was Mamie Smith. And in 1920, she sang a rendition of a song called Crazy Blues, which was by a, a fella named Perry Bradford. Um, you don't need to know that about Perry Bradford. You just need to know Mamie Smith was the first African-American blues singer to record on a record. And when we listen to this recording here in a bit, obviously it's on Spotify, but you can hear the old crackles and pops. It's, it's the old school record. It's so neat. Um, it's going to sound a little strange to your ears at first because we're so used to like computerized music, but it's kind of neat to listen to. It's almost like you're listening back in time. That was recorded a hundred years ago this year, 1920. How crazy is that? You also need to know that W.C. Handy is typically called the father of the blues. He was a trumpet player and he sort of, um, kind of set, set the stage for the blues. <clears throat> I'm going to read you this little clump here, this little paragraph from his autobiography in 1941. In his 1941 autobiography, Handy wrote, A lean, loose-jointed Negro had commenced plunking a guitar beside me while I slept. His clothes were rags. His feet peeped out of his shoes. His face had on it some of the sadness of the ages. As he played, he pressed a knife on the strings of a guitar in a manner popularized by Hawaiian guitarists who used a steel, who used steel bars. The effect was unforgettable. His song, too, struck me instantly. Going where the Southern crossed the dog. The singer repeated the line three times, accompanying himself on the guitar with the weirdest music I ever heard. The song referred to the crossing of the Southern and Yazoo and Mississippi Valley Railroads in Moorhead, Mississippi. It was nicknamed the Dog or Yellow Dog. So this instance, W.C. Handy's at like, I think it was a train station, right? And he sees this guy with a guitar and he's using, well, I'll demonstrate as best I can. I'll use a pair of scissors to represent our, our pocket knife here. So he's sitting there. Again, I'm not a great guitarist, but I'll... So he's using the knife against the strings to create kind of a... I'm doing my best here with my, my scissors. Okay, now, obviously you could go on YouTube and find someone infinitely better. I'm just showing you the sound, kind of haunting... These aren't level either. Hmm. I wish I had a, a flat pocket knife here with me. But um, you may have seen people using slide tubes before, right? Where it's a little metal tube they put on their finger and they go, wow. I'll post a video of someone who actually is doing it properly. 
Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you a taste of what that sound, you know, is like. So WC Handy had like this, almost this religious experience, seeing this guy play the guitar and sing, using that knife on the guitar. And after that, he was a blues guy. Um, so I, don't know, I just like that little clip because that's a huge moment in music history when WC Handy hears that guy um, playing the guitar. All right. So just like with the spirituals, and you're going to use the same Google Doc. Okay. So spirituals and blues, you can use the same Google Doc. We might even use the same Google Doc for all five origins. Okay. Why, why bother making five? Um, so you're going to go over to that same Google Doc and define blues, blue notes, blues form, improvising, call and response. All right. So for the first time uh, in this class, we're going to do a little exercise I call who dat, which who dat is just like, who is this person? All right. So again, you're going to have to probably jot them down on a piece of paper or in your Google Doc since this is a PDF. If you can print it, that's great, but don't sweat it. And you need to know who these people are. And you might be like, uh, Olson, how do I know? And that's when you're going to use the class website, which if you go into our Google Drive folder, if you go down to the bottom, there is the website, okay? I think it's also, well, I'll list it in this document that you're going to be reading. But you're going to go over to the website. Here, I'll pull it up here. Ooh, it's raining. I can hear it. Okay. Click on Origins up at the top. We just did spirituals. Now remember, there's no who dat for spirituals because we don't know who wrote those songs, right? They were passed down, passed down from generation to generation. We don't know who wrote them. But if you scroll down to the blues, we start to have songs that are attributed to certain people. Okay, so like here, we have WC Handy, the Memphis Blues, and this all correlates to Spotify. Okay, Mamie Smith, Crazy Blues, Bessie Smith, Nobody Knows When You're Down and Out, Gertrude Ma Rainey, Runaway Blues, Robert Johnson, Sweet Home Chicago, Arthur Big Boy Crudup, that's all right. Getting a little later, we have Muddy Waters, Rolling Stone, or the Catfish Blues, and Howl and Wolf Spoonful, and B.B. King, The Thrill is Gone. Now, these artists also go in chronological order. So, all the way to W.C. Handy, who's the father of the blues, this is the guy who heard the man playing at the train station with the knife on the guitar and was like, what the what? And became a blues guy. All the way to B.B. King, who, um, I think he passed away within the last five years. So, much more recent. I think B.B. King passed away. That's sad when you have to check. So many people, great musicians have died in the last few years. You really need to check these days. 2015. Okay, so he died about five years ago. Rest in peace, PB. But, um, so the website will show you who the people are. And also has these YouTube videos. If you have good Wi-Fi, you can listen to them on YouTube as well. If you do not have good Wi-Fi, I would not recommend, especially if you're on satellite or, um, you know, if you're on HughesNet or Windstream, whatever it's called, don't use these YouTube videos because they'll suck up all your bandwidth and you won't be able to do anything else, okay? All right, I'm going to close the website on Spotify. Right down here under Roll Jordan Roll, which was the last one for the spirituals, it goes into the blues, and they should be in the same order. If not, make sure you're paying attention, but I'm 99% I, sure they are. All your songs here, all the way down to The Thrill is Gone. Okay, so that is your assignment for the blues. Oh, and here's your listening jots. So when you're listening, make sure you're making your jots, just like spirituals. We're going to do that every time. Okay? So you need to know who the definitions, the who dat, and do your jots. And that is your bit for the blues. All right? I hope you guys are doing okay. Please let me know if you have any questions. Bye!